Heartbeat Alaska is also brought to you by Frontier Flying Service. Thank you, Frontier, for getting Heartbeat Alaska airborne. Heartbeat Alaska would also like to thank Browns Electric for their generous support. Heartbeat Alaska is also brought to you by Comtech Business Systems Incorporated and by the Maniluk Association, providing health and social services to residents of Northwest Alaska for over 30 years. Heartbeat Alaska is also brought to you by Ed's Kasilov Seafoods. Welcome to Heartbeat Alaska Native News and Information. I'm Jeannie Green. Thank you so very much for joining us. Today we travel to Tanana, Alaska for a dog mushing symposium. And we learn the wisdom of dog mushing from over a dozen mushers. Join me now as we travel to Tanana, Alaska, dog mushing country. Go! It's called Nuchilawoya, the place where two rivers meet. It's here that the Tanana River runs into the mighty Yukon River. Just two miles west of this junction sits the Athabascan community of Tanana. Due to its location, Tanana was a traditional trading settlement for the Koyakon and Tanana Athabascans long before European contact. At the turn of the century, Tanana was a thriving village. In 1898, Fort Gibbon was founded at Tanana to maintain the telegraph line between Fairbanks and Nome, and the mighty Yukon became a highway for gold seekers who were headed north. Today, the Yukon River still serves as a highway, but in a much different fashion. For those who live along the Yukon and the many other rivers that run through Alaska, a busy highway means more than one dog team on the river. Here in Tanana, the Yukon River links many interior communities together and serves as a road system for the people of these villages. For centuries, the people of the Yukon have followed the rivers, whether it be for subsistence hunting and trapping or for traveling. Historically, the most common means of transportation for the people has always been dog sleds. With the invention of the snow machine, dog teams became used less and less for daily activities and eventually took on a new role. Sprint and long distance racing. Today, dog mushing is a competitive sport with high-tech gear and big money purses. 
The dogs are bred for speed and endurance and are quite different from the traditional sled dogs. Short hair Eurohounds have become popular racing dogs because of their slim builds and fast feet. The toboggan style work sleds, traditionally used for subsistence gathering, have been replaced with smaller, sleeker, and much lighter racing sleds. Yes, it's safe to say that dog mushing has changed drastically. For many people today, dog mushing is known as a tough sport, but for some, it's still remembered as a way of life that once was. I thought it'd be really a cool idea to, to invite a dog mushers here to Tanana because Tanana is such a dog mushing community. And we, we've always been a real, um, really into dog mushing here in Tanana, and, and it's really uh, important for us to keep this tradition alive here. As part of the wellness initiative sponsored by the Alaska Federation of Natives, Julie Roberts of Tanana came up with the idea of holding a dog musher symposium as a way of promoting a healthy lifestyle through dog mushing. Guest dog mushers from across the state were invited to the symposium to discuss a variety of topics surrounding dog mushing and how running dogs has helped these athletes to live a healthy lifestyle. World-class mushers such as George Atma, Benedict Jones, Joe Reddington Jr., and Charlie Boulding, Lester Earhart, and countless others were invited to take part in this three-day symposium that shared the secrets of these champions and explored the timeless tradition of dog mushing. The design of the race sled didn't come out till mid-40s. Like we said, we use freight sled for hauling freight and wood and stuff like that. In the old days, there never was any uh, sled designed for jeep pool. A lot of people use jeep pool for snowshoeing or a pair of skis in front of the sled to steer the big sleighs. So in the mid 40s, they finally came up with a shorter sled, four foot basket. Before that was average seven or eight foot basket sleds. That's what the people use. Bendik, you touched on an interesting, uh, the g pole. I don't think, you know, our, our kids over here, they probably don't even know what g pole is. And I know my mom used to, to ride on g pole, you know, to, to haul wood. But I think there's a lot of, you know, our younger people who don't even know what that even looked like or don't even, probably never even heard the word. <laughs> yeah, I just want to show you kids what the g pole is. It's, it's uh, tight on the right hand side from your front runner to the bow, and the pole is about five feet long, and you stand on a pair of skis on the front, and it, there's a, a wheel dog between you. So when you want to go around a curve, you just automatically, and there's rope attached to the ski, so when you fall off the skis, your, uh, the skis will go along with the dogs. Years ago, when we were building the sleds, uh, we used to tie them together with a uh, rope that we make out of moose hide. And now these new sleds, they're, because of the flexibility that's wanted in the sled, we, uh, we've done away with all of that. And the sleds I'm building now are completely built out of uh, just using bolts and plastic and uh, some snow machine parts in there. The mushers and, discussed uh, everything from the old style sleds to the harnesses that were used they were. decades they were ago. With, but they were heavy leather collars. They were diameter about 10 inches maybe, real thick leather on them, and they had a wire sticking out on the ends. And uh, eventually I, I watched them build with uh, cotton webbing, build harnesses to it. And that was the neck collar. That's the part that slipped over the dog's neck. And he just pulled on this circle around his neck. They had this uh, single tray harness that would stick on the back. They used to call that gnome harness. And uh, they had that uh, harness that goes underneath the arm and one strap on the back. They call that siwash harness. 
And uh, another one was a uh, choke harness. I know that Stickman used to use that uh, choke harness that goes right. But you know, we had choke harness. So you can't use it for working. I remember going to the AC store, or NC store, whichever it was back then, and getting lamp wick because that was cotton webbing. That was what we used. They didn't just sell it in little six inch long pieces like they do nowadays. They came in a big roll, just like you see a roll of webbing. And um, at least that's what I used for lamp, rick, lamp wicking anyway. And, uh, and it was cotton and then you'd use felt or some sort of blanket or something like that for the padding. And boy, did those things, you know, if you had a brake trail or it was warm weather, or, I mean, they just got wet anyway. Basically, uh, you know, they, they were f frozen by the end of the day. And you, you always, every single cabin you stopped at, you had a, that was just standard. You brought the harnesses in and dried them out. You had nails all behind the stove. I saw my mom do this so many times. That pups, starting from pups, nine months old, pups, six months old. She would make harness for a different bunch as they were growing up. We got different size harness, and it's all custom designed. She look at the dog, and she makes sure that dog will fit that harness. If it don't fit right, then she changed the, take the harness apart to a certain place, and she makes it fit. But uh, my mom was good on dogs, way better than me. For these dog mushers, it was an opportunity to reminisce about the good old days, reliving the experiences that have made them the heroes they are to many people around the world, both young and old. But more than that, it was a gathering of the pioneers of dog mushing, the ones who were there when running dogs changed from an everyday activity to a world-class sporting event. The backbone of dog mushing is the women. Because I was... <laughs> because I was there. Henry, Henry used to work every, leave us every April to get on that plane. I had to I was stuck with the dogs and the kids. I cut fish. I go I had fish wheel up up the river here. I get up early in the morning go up there in the boat while the kids are sleeping. Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> well, we're trying to save dog mushing, you know, and uh, kind of teach the kids the part of our culture. And, uh, and you know, it, it was part of our heritage. That's something that went with it. the Indian people all the time. Native people always had dogs. And, and, and the ones that stay in fish camp have dogs too. I, I try to make sure that these kids learn stuff and try to set them all in the right direction. You know, that's, it's, it's very important that they get that way. So we go from hole to hole, and then when we get to the last hole, we pull the pole back out from under the water. During a short intermission, veteran musher Benedict Jones took time to show the kids some photos and teach them a little more about their heritage and a day gone by. When you look at these mushers, you can see that the lifestyle they chose to pursue has not only brought them recognition and fame, but has kept them healthy and in good shape. The cardiovascular the thing in, in running dogs, the cardiovascular part, it really, uh, it keeps you, uh, it keeps you uh, heart pumping. Uh, I'm, I'm 62 years old and I have, you know, good cardio, good cardiovascular and, and uh, a lot of, you know, a lot of stamina that if I had not got into dogs when I was, I'm actually not very young, I was uh, like, what was I, 40, uh, 38 years old when I first got into dogs, I was 40 years old. And uh, if I hadn't uh, got, uh, did, got into dogs, I wouldn't be nearly as good a physical condition as I am today. Because um, 
you know, nobody's going to get on that treadmill or go to that gym every day or do whatever, do a 500 setups or whatever it is you want to do. Uh, it all sounds good, but nobody does it. But when you got the dogs, you have to do it. You know, it ain't like it don't take much discipline. You know, you got to run them, and so you got to be out there doing it. And it's a motivation to keep you really active. It's a sport that keeps you active, keep your mind active, and uh, like for instance, you you know, you're handling their food all the time when it comes in, uh, either on a barge or or uh, airplane, you know, and uh, you have to handle all that stuff. And then every day they're drinking, well, uh, my kennel is very small right now, but they probably, drink and eat about 10 gallons of food a day, you know, and you have to carry all that stuff, you know. And it just keeps you moving all the time, you know. And I'm uh, 71 years old now, and I still feel good, you know. I mean, for me, it makes me feel good, you know. I mean, I'm always doing something, you know. I mean, you know, even when you go out to water dogs in the morning, they're happy to see you, and it always makes your day, or my day, anyway. I used to be a drinker. I can't afford to drink anymore, so. <laughs> but that's one health benefit. And I used, and I was a smoker. So, when I got my first dog team uh, down in, down in uh, Montana, uh, we trained up in the mountains because, you know, that's, they got trails up there and lots of snow. Uh, I'm trained. Actually, I wasn't training. We just go out and run dogs, you know. So we run the dogs up the mountains. And that first team I bought wasn't really good dogs. And uh, the big hills, they just didn't pull you up. It. You, had to <laughs> you, had to, you had to run up the hills. They'd pull the sled. And they'd pull a little bit of weight and you had to sled, but if you got on the runners, uh-uh. <laughs> that didn't work. So, uh, and I thought, I, and uh, I'd never been around anybody or any, any sled dogs or anybody that knew anything about sled dogs, so I didn't know that they were supposed to pull me up the hill. But anyway, I ran, and I come back to the truck this one day, and I was almost dead. I was wheezing, and I was panting. And, and my, my chest hurt, I was spitting up. And I had a pack of cigarettes there and I threw them on the dash. I said, you know, these dogs have gotta go, or these cigarettes have gotta go. And I quit smoking. And that was, uh, that was in 1980, so that was 20, 25 years ago. So that was a huge health benefit right there. Was, the dogs caused me to give up, give up cigarettes. It was a healthy lifestyle, and when you have dogs, you have to care for them, and it kind of takes you away from other things, and you have to take care of them, make sure they got good bedding, and they got good food, and stuff like that, and you have to keep them exercised, and every day they require, you know, that you have to work on them, and I think that's one of the reasons why I stayed in such good shape. I always maintain that I tell the people, if I didn't have dogs, I'd be over 600 pounds or maybe dead already, you know. <laughs> Did you know that if the youth took money for prizes in dog mushing, they are now considered professionals? So, in order to deal with this, the residents of Tanana came up with a solution. And a signature from a famous dog musher does the trick. The Tanana Dog Musher Symposium was much more than an opportunity to learn about dog mushing from the pros. It was a weekend packed full of events for all ages. Guys wanna, kids want to come up and uh, sign up for the dog race. Kids lined up to take part in the Junior Mushers Race, a three-mile sprint race up the Yukon River. Most people want to go and sign up with Joey. He wants to be Joey's passenger. But they want to sign up. While the veteran mushers took the liberty of autographing awards for the junior mushers. First kid to draw is Ezra Conrad. <laughs> no.
Number four. Second one is Cy Conrad. Number six. Number three. But first, just like with the pros, these junior mushers had to attend a pre-race mushers meeting. If someone is catching you, just pull over the best you can so that they can get by so we don't have no dog tangles. And we'll probably get a lot of people out there to help you guys all the way around or so. Um, if you can't break your feet, don't use the brake. If you have to, use the brake. It was obvious that these kids rode the runners before. One by one, they left the starting line. Oh. And one by one, teams cross the finish line. 37, After the race, it was time to head back to the rec hall for a potlatch and the presentation of the awards. Third place was Ezra Conrad and Landon Erickson. Number two was Cy Conrad and Richard Nathaniel. And number one was Charlie Earhart and Rhiannon Summer. Thank you. There's an apparent sense of pride that glows from the youth of Tanana, whether they're running dogs or singing the songs of their ancestors. It's the kind of pride that can never be taken away from the Athabascans of interior Alaska, a pride that has been handed down from generation to generation. From the pounding drum in the center of the circle to the two-stepping shuffle of the fiddling music, the Athabascan people walk with their heads held high. Thank you everyone for joining me for Heartbeat Alaska Native News and Native Information. Join me again next week when we travel again to Tanana, Alaska and glean these pearls of wisdom from the dog mushers of the past. 
These guys are so tough and so ready to share their information. This is a great show. I hope you tune in. I'm Jeannie Green. God bless every single one of you, and we'll see you again next week. I thought racers were, uh, were uh, sort of nuts. I, uh, I'd, I'd uh, heard about George Atlans and I uh, read his story, and I knew he was nuts. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I didn't want nothing to do with that racing part. <laughs> I hope, hope George heard that. The thing that was going through in my uh, mind when I ran the Iditarod was, I must be crazy. And I really didn't, uh, after it was over, I thought, it wasn't that bad, you know? So I tried it again, and that's when I really found out I was crazy then. Oh, my God.